Okay, what is up? Y'all, there's no way at all I had to pull over and get my life together and turn my cameras on because I'm always prepared for every vlogging situation. So, I don't know what you thought you saw, but it definitely was not that. So, let's get to it. Standard YouTube greetings and customs and all that stuff. Welcome to my subscribers. Welcome back. Thanks for your time. Appreciate the numbers steadily ticking up. Appreciate all the randos and visitors to the channel. And if this is your first time coming through, this is a motorcycle movie review. This is why I ride around on my motorcycle, combining two of my most favorite things, riding and movies, and trying not to get dead at the same time. While recalling as much information as I can about a movie and also trying to give a very good subjective review. So if this is not your cup of tea, go ahead and check out some of my other content located over there. But ding ain't working. Something no man wants to say. Let's try it again. Content. There we go. Got it. So let's get to it. Invisible Man. The Invisible Man. This generation's current taking on the classic H.G. Wells novel, 1897, I believe. Uh, the last rendition that I believe I saw that was worth the watch was Hollow Man Kevin Bacon 20 years ago. I enjoyed Hollow Man. I think I like this one a little bit better. So let's get into the meat and taters. This is a Universal Pictures picture in association with Blumhouse, which is pretty much known for their spooky, scary genre type flicks. I enjoy Blumhouse movies because they, uh, they do pretty well to me. I, I they, they got a nice, good looking feel to them, and they're usually on a six to seven scale with me. With this movie coming out at a solid seven, seven point five, I do believe for this rendition of the Invisible Man. So it starts off pretty ominous with the dark seascape, uh, you know, waves bashing up against some kind of rock face, and it gives it a little bit of foreshadowing. It has the name of the movie and all its, you know, the, the introductory type title stuff with uh, the invisible man type uh, CG effect that shows that maybe something has to do with water in the movie. Eh, let's go this way. And uh, it, it just got a little bit of foreshadowing. So it gets right to it. It don't waste any time. It starts off with our main protagonist, the uh, Miss Elizabeth Moss, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Moss. Her most notable role right now is Handmaid's Tale. She's been in all kinds of stuff, but that's like the most recent, most current thing she's in in the, the TV genre type area. Um, she's laying in bed. Uh, she plays Cecilia with uh, uh, some dude. You, you don't know who he is quite yet. Uh, you're like, okay, well, what's going on here? She's trying to sneak out of bed. His arms are wrapped around her. She gets up, she's walking around. She's putting some diazepam into his drink. You're like, oh, wait, what is this? She's trying to poison him? Is, this, it, what, is she a bad guy? Is she a good guy? Is he in his abusive relationship? Is this? She's trying to get away. She's just sneaking around, making sure he's knocked out. She grabs various items from around the house. She's getting a bag full of stuff. She's crawling in the crawling in closets, and uh, it's just looking really weird. Then she goes downstairs to some very set up, well set up room, which is all kind of technology stuff. And then you're like, okay, is this corporate espionage? What, what is going on here? She's stealing. You have no clue because they give you no details. They just get straight to it. So what they do is they have her running around doing all this quietness and uh she, she is like super super sneaky like super sneaky doing everything she can to not make noise she's walking around the house and then all of a sudden she turns the corner straight punts a dog bowl these movies do so well the blumhouse series of movies do very well and not necessarily jump scares but they keep your anxiety level high. The way that they did this, the filmography, the cinematography, uh, is very tasteful, in my opinion. This whole scene was about eight minutes of silence. There was no soundtrack. It was all ambient noise and background noise, and what they did was they would always pan the camera before she got to a place, making you think there was something already there. Like, you're already looking for the Invisible Man this early in the movie, and you're like, no way, it can't be this early in the movie. And of course it was not, but still. So she's walking around, she kicks the dog bowl and I about pooped my pants. I was like, I don't know what she's doing, but she about to get caught. She, she, she gonna get dead, whatever's happening. But she didn't, she ends up getting all her things, getting out of the house, getting to the garage. And it's a very nice house, it was obviously loaded. So uh, of course the, the dog, you're like, where's the dog this whole time? Dog's in the garage, runs up to her, he's got a shot collar on. She takes the shot collar off. She's like, I can't take you with me, but I'm not going to leave you like this. And ends up bumping into the car. The dog bumps the car, sets the alarms off. I'm like, oh, that's it. Her dishes are done. She's she about to get it. 
but she ends up climbing over this large gate and then of course absconding into the night and uh, you're like okay well she's getting away then a uh, cohort pops up which is Emily her sister uh, in the middle of the road she's standing there with a flashlight you're like bro turn the flashlight off you run from somebody turn off the light what are you doing she didn't do that she kept the flashlight on cars coming down the road you figure it's the dude that's chasing her because usually in these type of movies that's who it is because he already found her somehow he got to the car got on the road but no it was her sister she picked her up and then this guy comes bolting out of the woods and this just gives the car to man she punches straight through the window i mean he runs up and he was just like Pow! bloody hand and everything now mind you while she was uh this car is on my toots while she was uh, trying to get out of the house she grabbed the bottle of the diazepam that she used to uh, kind of knock him out with and uh she dropped it right outside her sister's car as she was trying to escape so the guy picks it up of course this may play a role later in the movie you assume it will he's going to use it to track her down or whatever what have you so cut to two weeks later she's now staying at a friend's house uh played by uh aldis hodge he's uh i i don't really know all of his bodies of work but he's a pretty good actor big dude uh he had his own he had his own section of a uh, episode of black mirror in the actual black museum episode which is pretty good um she's trying to think of his other stuff but he's he plays detective james lanier and who is the father of storm reed she was in my what a, a movie i really enjoyed with called don't let go 2019 with uh david oluyo uh oye lowo and uh she plays his daughter sydney so now you got the cast uh she's been hiding out of his house for at least two weeks she's trying to come out of her shell uh she's afraid the guy's gonna find her the sister shows up she tells the sister hey stop visiting me here i told you he gonna find me sister's like i'm just trying to bring you some news he killed himself she shows him an article that there's some optics tech guy big guy in optics who committed suicide and now they have to deal with the fall off from that so the sisters they end up going to some type of arbitration meeting with uh oh come on man you can't be calling me in the middle of a movie review the i'm gonna try to talk through this but my ringtone is probably recording right now <sighs> this, this is this is just, people have no professional professionalism this is just trying to do it's business here so uh the sister uh acts as her kind of arbitrary arbitrator jesus if i could talk it would be a better world and the brother of the gentleman who is her boyfriend i forgot his name already because i just watched the movie his name is tom is the lawyer the lawyer of the dead brother is holding this session to where she's being left five million dollars five milli for whatever reason she's a girlfriend it wasn't even his wife so whatever reason he left her money in the will and the only stipulations were she had to maintain her mental health and she could not commit any crimes now of course this is foreshadowing because you know something's going to happen right they leave the situation she's supposed to be getting a hundred thousand a month for like the next four plus years or something like that you know regarding if she maintained all of those stipulations that they laid out she signs on a dotted line of course goes back home to celebrate and she now gives the little girl sydney the money some of it she gives her like a ten thousand dollar stipend that she says she's going to draw uh drop into her account every month for her to pursue her dreams in art school and the dad's happy the daughter's happy to go to celebrate but then immediately sinister things start to happen around the house stuff starts moving she starts hearing creaky noises it gets really weird really fast and i enjoy that about this movie because again they play on the soundtrack by using no soundtrack there's a there's a lot of scenes where it's so quiet and they just pan the camera and you just wait for something to happen and nothing happens absolutely nothing it's crazy it gets your nerves all nuts what got the yellow gloves okay and uh it's not so it, it, you know this is all happening within a very short time span now they're at home the detective james lanier which you find out he's a cop later is leaving for the day to go and do his detective duties the daughter and cecilia are at home and uh sorry about the noise but this uh very rude motorcycle likes to pipe up on me when I'm trying to talk. Cecilia and Sydney are at home. Cecilia's making breakfast and she turns down the eye, goes to check on the little girl, wake her up to get her ready for school, and all of a sudden the eye pops up. Now you know Invisible Man's in the house. The ex-boyfriend who committed suicide faked his death. Or that's what she believes, right? She thinks 
Something's going on. She knew he was an optics guy, and she's like, mm, something ain't right. She's got this really weird feeling. Now, later that night, they're asleep. I don't know why the little girl, or she's not a little girl, she's like a teenager, almost adult. She's about to go to college, and Cecilia are in the same bed, but you know, women do that. They just fall asleep, whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, the blanket comes off of them. You, know, you see a flash, 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 flash. Somebody in there creeping, taking pictures. She gets up, tries to figure out why she's so cold, looks around, nothing. She sees a dummy standing in front of her and she freaks out but she realizes oh crap it's just the dummy that the little girl used because she's trying to study fashion blah 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 she gets up to pick up the blanket and she drags it and then she looks over at a chair she thinks she sees the chair uh depressed like an indentation in the chair she throws the blanket over and I, nothing huh. messing with your nerves so bad then she goes to walk away with the blanket and it won't move because the guy is stepping on it holy crap she freaks out screams james runs down tries to figure out what's going on of course nobody's there everybody thinks she's crazy move on to the next scene now they're trying to convince her that she is fine uh her and james have now gone back to the lawyer office who is tom of course and he's like look you need to uh stop letting this dude affect you he's dead and don't bring it back to life by you know allowing this type of behavior to to drive you crazy now before this happened before they got back to the lawyer's office she also had a job interview she has a portfolio she's like a a architectural designer or some crap she went to job interview all of her artwork is gone she gets up to walk away and figures something's wrong she passes out she goes to the hospital they run her blood work she's got a high amount of diazepam in her blood that night after the shower she gets out in the bathroom looks over there's the same bottle that she dropped while she was trying to keep the dude knocked out the night she escaped over two weeks ago holy crap so now you go back to the point where she is sitting at the lawyer's office trying to tell him hey your brother's stalking me he's still alive he faked his death he was a genius so he could do this the brother's like nah i think you just need to relax and chill out okay she goes back home she goes to talk to her sister about the dealings and things that's going on in her life and her sister completely shuts her out completely she's crying at the door she's like i, I don't want to deal with you i'm sick of your crap i'm never bailing you out again and she's serious like yo what the, like uh, i what's going on she's like i got the email you sent me i never wanted your money you calling me this you calling me that she's like, i didn't send you no email turns out she did send in an email or at least her account did the email was sent by of course none other than the invisible man from her account to her sister calling her all types of naughty names and bad stuff which is not cool and she starts flipping out she's crying she's going through her various stages of emotional grief and then sydney walks into the room tries to console her says hey we're gonna kick my dad out let's have a girls night and then she agrees yeah let's get some ice cream and then bow (laughs) sydney it's not funny it was i mean uh, the way I said it is funny, but Sydney catches one right in the face. The dad runs in. Sydney's freaking out. She's like, Cecilia just hit me for no reason. She's like, I didn't touch you. I would never hurt you. Invisible Man straight mopped her up. It was, it sucked. It, it's a very messed up scene. Uh, he only hit her once. And the dude's like, look, I'm out. I got to take my daughter and get away from you. You going through something. You need to back off. I'm out. So they left her there by herself. Of course, this is what he's trying to do, get her isolated because she was in an abusive relationship before. This movie is a very good allegory for uh, abusive relationships, by the way. He tries to get her isolated, make people think that she's crazy, and, you know, make her more vulnerable. So they left. So she's like, all right, I'm done with this. She gets the coffee, throws the coffee on the floor, grabs a steak knife, backs herself into a room, wait for him to crawl out, you know, walk over to coffee ground. So she's sitting there talking to herself. She assumes she's talking to him. But you also assume maybe she's talking to herself. Maybe he left by now. Nothing happens. Complete silence. She's waiting on him to step over to coffee. Nothing. So, okay. She's like, all right. Well, let me get this random idea. For whatever reason, she decides to grab her phone and call Adrian. Adrian. Aha. I remember his name. The old boyfriend's phone. And it rings. She can hear it vibrating in the house. Holy crap. At this point, I'm out. I'm th- look the dead boyfriend who charged in the phone he did phone two weeks my phone lasts maybe a day and a half something ain't right no matter how you put your fingers on it so i i I, nope out so she decides to investigate the ringing of course it's coming from somewhere she hears it she looks up camera pans out 
it's coming from the attic. Oh, never go into the attic. Ever. Don't even store stuff in the attic. Don't. No attics, all houses. Just take them out. So she goes upstairs. She gets the ladder, of course. And uh, nothing's happening. She got the steak knife still. And uh, which is very smart. I mean, if you leave, you're going to go to the attic, take a stabby tool. So she goes up there with the steak knife and uh, just waits. Nothing happens. She looks over in the corner. She says, hey, it's my portfolio. Here's some other things that have been missing around the house. Here's another knife in a bag. I'm like, what the? What was the knife in the bag? She calls the phone again and it rings. It lights up in the corner. She goes to see it. She picks it up. She's like, what the crap? And all of a sudden, she gets a text from an unknown number to his phone that just says, surprise. So she's like, all right, I'm getting up out of here. She turns to go back down the ladder from the attic. Ooh, really? What is that a Bentley? Well, gee, dang it. Um, it looks ominous. Looks like some storms coming. Uh, so she she looks down and silence again. God, this movie. And luckily, somehow there's a can of paint without the top on it, just to the left of her in the attic, because the house that they're in right now, they were currently remodeling. You have to see the movie, of course, but a lot of these things make sense as you watch the movie. So she grabs the paint, throws it down, blah, catches the dude right in the face. He's all white. You know, it, it, the outline of his silhouette is white. And she's like, all right, I got you. He kicks down the ladder, runs off, and you think he left the house. No way, Jose. He's still in the house. Somehow he got the paint off of him, which I've painted plenty of times. The paint is not coming off in 0.45 seconds. Not going to happen. So he gets the paint off of him. She's running around the house trying to, you know, see where he went, chasing the paint drops. And then she's in the kitchen. And then he just starts giving her the whoop sauce. He starts handling her up. He, so he WWE's her across a table. He picks her up one-handed, throws her up against a wall. Like, this dude is incredibly strong. And, uh, you know, she starts getting the business. She escapes, of course. She beats him with a couple plates. She just throws everything in his general direction. And, uh, you know, she gets out, calls an Uber. <laughs> Get her off the street in the middle of the night. It's like 3 in the morning. So the Uber gets her, drives her off out of the city to Adrian's estate. She's like, I need you to take me to this address. So for whatever reason, I don't know what she got in her head. She goes to the estate to try to figure out some clues, see what's going on. Now the driver takes her all the way there. She's like, stay here, wait for me, I'll be back. Now at this point, you assume that the driver's gonna stay there. The dude's gonna show up, shake up the driver, and he gonna get dead, she gonna be trapped there. Well, that didn't happen The driver. They actually drove off, but she did have an incident. While inside of this compound, she rolls in and then the dog pops out. I'm like, oh, the dog. So it's got to be either the boyfriend or the brother at this point. You assume it's the brother because the brother is kind of weird. But you're just like, okay, maybe it is the boyfriend. But it, you know, like, okay, well, you know, it's just a movie. Common sense dictates that if it ain't the brother, it's the boyfriend. It's just one of those clues you can pick up. So she goes downstairs into the tech room again and she discovers a room where the suit was housed with all these cameras and optical devices, of course, because this, eye, this guy was an op, optical magnate tech guy. She hits a couple buttons. She sees that something is watching her, but of course it's the output of the suit reflecting the images around her, therefore rendering itself invisible, hence the invisible man's capabilities, right? So she finds another suit. He has a spare suit. She takes the suit, hides it in the same stash spot that she hid her stuff in the beginning of the movie, she was getting ready to leave and then she ran ran into a closet like okay number two move besides going into the attic don't go into the closet of course he knows somebody's in the house because during this time he has arrived home somehow because i mean she drove for some like an hour it was night when she left it was daytime when she got there somehow he got there quick enough just to catch her trying to get out the closet she is upset she got that stank walk she likes it whoever she go home to but get it um so she goes in the closet the guy of course opens the closet she looks down watches one single footprint step on the carpet she tries to run out Beep! gives her the business again tosses her across the floor you know tries to handle up on her but then the dog comes to her rescue zeus the dog the same dog boulder she kicked and rest took the shot collar off he starts barking at the air and she runs off jumps in the uber and out so she gets back to the city she's called her oh 
deer got dead. That's bloated. It's been out there for a minute. Um, whew. Yeah, it's been out there. So she gets back to the city. In the meantime, she's called her sister, told her sister to meet her in a public place. Uh, she's like, I love you. Uh, I apologize for all the stuff that's going on. But she's like, Adrian is doing this to me. I'm trying to tell you right now. I got a thing. I found out what's going on. He's trying to get me. I got a secret I need to tell you. And as she's telling her sister this information, her sister looks off and to the left. And she's like, what the hell? What you looking at? She turns right. And then a steak knife is just floating in the air. Shazam. Right across the throat. And then this knife just... This part was weird. It was like her hand was magnetic, but the knife flew into her hand as if he threw it into her hand. And her fingers, like, gripped around it, which was really weird. It's not your turn. You better not go, you lady. Don't look at me. It ain't your turn. You know you was wrong. Why are you sneaking out? Stay behind the stop sign. Um, God, Michigan drivers, boy. I tell you what. So the knife flicks into her hand, and then the one lady, the whole restaurant's just chilling, and then she looks over and screams her freaking head off. And then, of course, Cecilia is uh, apprehended a short time later with no resistance because she's like, what the hell just happened? My sister's dead. She gets taken to a, a psychiatric hospital and admitted, of course, and they're trying to get all this information out of her. And, of course, nobody believes her because she's talking about an invisible man because who would believe that? Nobody, I say. And then, of course, uh, he's in the room. He's there the whole time she's getting harassed by all these medical personnel. They doped her up. She's yelling like he's right there. I can see you. She can't see him, but she's making him think that he, she can see him, you know. And they're like, yeah, lady, stab with the needle. You're going to sleep. So she goes to her various council sessions and, you know, the, the, the whole thing. You get the montage of when people go to... Uh, psychiatric places and they you know help check the tongue and do the pill thing all that crap so now she's like trying to figure out a way to get out of here james is pretty much thinks she's lost it you know her sister's dead it's just not a good situation for this young lady so now the brother has come to visit her and tell her that she has violated the stipulations of her five million dollar stipend right talk about pouring salt in the wound he came to say you done went nuts and you ain't getting no more money what a bum that dude's a bum so of course she's none too happy about this turn of events and she's like, nah, I'm not taking the deal. He puts a piece of paper on the desk for her to sign. She, of course, flicks it away. But in the meantime, this was just to distract him. She steals a pen out of his uh, briefcase, his attache. And, uh, of course, she's going to use it later for some type of escape attempt. I'm not sure what yet. But then he's like, you know what? You take the deal. You agree to have this baby. Oh, yeah, I forgot. She's pregnant. She was taking birth control pills the whole time, but this dude is smart, right? He's a genius. He's got cameras everywhere. He was switching out her birth control pills because he wanted to keep her because he wanted her to have his baby. The doctor found out she was pregnant the same day that she got drugged with the diazepam, but of course a lot of things happened in between then, and she was unable to inform Cecilia that she was pregnant. Crazy stuff going on here. So. Cecilia, of course, finds out she's pregnant while she's in the psychiatric hospital. And, of course, this is well before the brother gets there. The brother shows up. She's like, look, you keep the baby. Or he says, you keep the baby. And you return to Adrian. And we'll make this go away. She's like, wait, what? He's alive? The brother's alive. Holy crap. So there's two of them now. So now you don't know which one's the invisible man. Now you assume it's Adrian. Because he's alive. He faked his own death. The brother's just covering for him. And he's a lawyer. Okay. She takes the pen, didn't want the deal. She stands up, and of course they, you know, take her away, take her back to her room or whatever. They do the same checks, tongue, you know, swallowing pills, all that crap. She hit the pen in the shower. She takes the pen and stabs her own wrist. She's about to commit suicide. She's like, you never gonna get me, and you ain't gonna get this baby. Of course, he's in the room, stops her. And uh, this sets off some type of commotion. She's fighting with him. And she starts to stab him up with the pen. She starts getting him. Like, she got some good ones in. Like, I'm like, oh, she about to get this. This movie's over. It's about to roll credits. And then, of course, this brings the guards in. And this hospital has an alarming amount of armed guards. So he, the guard comes in. 
He's telling her to get back in the bed. She's looking over in the corner. The guard turns and sees this creature. And he's starting to flip out. He's trying to get his taser out. Of course, the guy gets up, turns the taser on him, zaps him in the throat. He got the shock neck now. He, you know, spazzed out and went to sleep. He goes sleeping night night. And uh, all these guards start showing up, and he just takes them out one by one. But they all start to see that there's something there. He's not completely invisible anymore. The suit's damaged. She's jacked it up. So he's kind of partially visible. And he's taking them all out. Of course, he gets a gun, shoots one guy in the knee with his own gun, throat checks a couple people, bops this one dude up against the wall through the glass, uh, you know, just taking people out left and right. And she gets a gun, chases him out because she can still partially see him. She's shooting at him, missing, of course, because he's fading in and out. They run out to the storm, hence the foreshadowing in the beginning of the movie, lots of water. She can see him partially, but then he disappears again. She finds him, he hems her up on the side of the EMS, and he's like, look, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt the people you love. So, of course, he goes through the whole situation where, I'm out, I'm about to go hurt your friend. So he goes to hurt Sydney and James, leaves her there, jumps in the car, and takes off. She, of course, shoots at him, misses. He makes another guy run off the road, and she takes that guy's car. Dude just crashed. She takes his car and then hangs up on his wife. <laughs> that, that was pretty funny. Uh, to me so she runs after them she's calling James saying hey you need to get home you need to check on Sydney she's in danger James is like how are you calling me right now you in a, a, a psychiatric hospital like what, what, what what's the deal she's like look man you need to shut up get to your daughter stop asking questions I told you the dude is after so he's like all right I'm out goes home all of a sudden you know of course he's you know in the meantime while he's going home what the driving in the uh, in the meantime, he's going home, and uh, Sydney's there by herself, of course. And Visible Man gets her in the hallway. You know, he he uh, is in her room, and she's sitting there thinking something's a little weird. She takes out the mace, and of course, her dad gave her because her dad is a police officer. And she just sprays wildly into the air. Whew, got the hot face. And of course, she zaps him. He's flipping out, breaking stuff because he got pepper sprayed and all this other stuff. So he he. He handles her once more. He tosses her out in the hallway. But then James gets home, trying to rescue his daughter, sees her getting, you know, attacked in the hallway, and he wants to go attack the guy, but you can't punch what you can't see. And then Invisible Man, of course, handles him up, chokes him out a little bit, beats him down, gives him a couple nice clocks to the head, and then he's done. But then by this time, Cecilia has, of course, made it home, grabbed the fire extinguisher from the kitchen, sprays him. He's covered in fire extinguisher dust. And then she laces him up with about six shots to the chest. Done. Reveals him to be the brother, Tom. And then, of course, a little while later, the police raid Adrian's compound when they find him tied up in the basement of his own home by his brother. And you're like, oh, crap. The brother was an invisible man. He faked his death. He wants the money. Blah, blah, blah. So he's like, no, no, no. He orchestrated all of this she was out to prove it. James is like, look, I need all of this evidence to get you out. They know that this person has been going around. They believe her. They believe the suit. They got the suit. They want to get her at the psychiatric hospital. She's like, I'm not agreeing to these terms. Somehow she's out on some type of release or whatever. She's out because all this stuff happened that they can prove now. Oh, man, look at that. That is a nice car. Hope the camera catches it. Hope I took my lens off. <laughs> that would suck if I didn't. So, James has agreed, of course, to let her wear a wire. She goes to Adrian's house, and they meet to have dinner. She calls him, and she's like, hey, we need to talk. And, of course, he's willing to talk because he wants to talk about all the events that were not his fault. It was all his brother's idea. They meet. They have a talk. She's like, I need you to admit this was you the whole time, and I'll keep the baby. He's like, I'm not dying. I'm not going to tell you that was me. It wasn't me. Of course, they go back and forth. He says something to her that really pisses her off. She's like, look, you know me. And he's like, I know you better than anybody. Nothing you ever say to me is going to be a surprise. Ding the text message that he sent her while she was trolling around in the attic about being a surprise. Oh, about to be a surprise in the back of this frame. This is the whole part where I try not to get dead, which I have succeeded once again. And uh, she's like, oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I think I'm losing my mind. I'm going to go check myself and clean myself up in the powder room. She goes off. And then like three minutes later, he slits his own throat. Of course, because she hid a suit in the closet earlier in the movie. 
She went and got that suit, put it on, slit his throat while on camera because his whole house has got cameras except for in a few places. He was in the kitchen or in the dining room by himself, slit his own throat. And then about a minute and a half later, she comes walking out of the bathroom, finds him, screams, calls 911, says, oh no, I'm with someone who just tried to kill himself. And then James, of course, hears all this because she's still wearing a wire, runs in to see her, and she steps out to look at him and goes, yeah, he's, uh, he killed himself. <laughs> just calm, cool, and collected. And then James looks down to see the suit in her bag, and she looks at her and was like, you weren't never trying to catch him, were you? She says, look, he killed himself, it's all on camera. Didn't he sound like a man that was desperate? James goes, yep, sounds like he killed himself. And then he lets her walk off into the night. Scott free. The movie is much better than I'm describing it to be. But man, it was pretty good. The anxiety level that this movie gives you, not so much Nightmare on Elm Street-ish, and not so much like a like a little kind of scream if you've been a fan of any of the original scream movies it's, it's kind of like that michael myers you're just waiting for something to happen but there's no jump scare music there is a surprisingly sound lack of music and it does well for this movie so if you guys got a few minutes go ahead and check it out if you have already sat through this entire review you know you want to hit that thumbs up go ahead and hit it go ahead and like subscribe if you've been here more than once and seen what it is it's free if not, I appreciate you watching anyway, and I will catch you guys later.